I feel like talking about Caligula all day today. I've just been doing a bit of a bit of research on Caligula. I uh, might do a, a deep dive into his psychology or maybe also Nero or Domitian, some of the crazier emperors. But I just thought I might do a short video just talking about some of the more scandalous uh, sort of salacious stories because it really is quite crazy. Uh, I wrote an article on Lotus Eaters the other day just mentioning some crazy people from history and just mentioned Caligula of course um, although it is slightly disputed whether he was clinically insane or just a, a horrible sadist and in the article I didn't really have time to go into the details all the stories little anecdotes you get so I thought I'd just uh, read some of them out from Suetonius the ancient historian Suetonius he was writing in about 100, maybe 120 AD, and Caligula's reign is in the, the late 30s AD. So it's, you know, it's maybe something like 80, 90 odd years. We don't know exactly between when Suetonius was writing and, and the events he's writing about. But I, I think apart from anything else, the tone is surprising. People that are maybe new to uh, the ancient historians, the, the tone of it is quite immediate. It's almost quite modern sounding, even though it's obviously in English translation from the original Latin, but it's just surprising surprising that this is you know from just after the age of Christ maybe like I say maybe 120 AD and this is the sort of thing you get for example here's the description in Suetonius of Caligula and we don't always get a good description but here's what he writes Caligula was tall with a pallid complexion he had a large body but a thin neck and spindly legs his eyes were sunken and his temples hollow although his forehead was broad and forbidding in contrast to his noticeably hairy body the hair on his head was thin, and his crown was completely bald. Because of his baldness and hairiness, he announced that it was a capital offence for anyone to either look down on him as he passed, or to mention goats in any context. He worked hard to make his naturally uncouth face even more repulsive by practising fearful grimaces in front of a mirror." End quote. Um, so it is sort of quite tabloidy, quite interesting, quite funny. People that know their ancient historians know that Suetonius is sort of famous for that. It's sort of the most gossipy in tone. But so, yeah, just to talk about some of the more kind of horrible and sordid things Caligula did. So uh, it, this really isn't child friendly. If there's any uh, if you're listening to this on speakers and there's kiddie winks in the room, you might want to save it for later or put some headphones in. But um, anyway, here's a, a few quotes from Suetonius. He sent a military tribune to kill young Tiberius, a member of his own family, without warning, on the pretext that Tiberius had insulted him by taking an antidote against poison, his breath smelt of it, and forced his father-in-law, Marcus Silanus, to cut his own throat with a razor, the charge being that he had not followed him when he put out to sea in a storm." End quote. And okay, it really does start to get a bit kind of dark and depraved. Uh, so, quote, it was his habit to commit incest with each of his three sisters in turn and at large banquets when his wife reclined above him, placed them in turn below him. They say that he ravished his sister Drusilla before he came of age. Their grandmother Antonia, at whose house they were both staying, caught them in bed together. Later he took Drusilla from her husband, the former consul Lucius Cassius Longinus, quite unashamedly treating her as his wife, end quote. I'll just reel them off. <laughs> Here's another. It would be hard to say whether the way he got married, the way he dissolved his marriages, or the way he behaved as a husband was the more disgraceful. He attended the wedding ceremony of Gaius Piso and Livia Australia, but had the bride carried off to his own home. After a few days, however, he sent her away, and two years later he banished her, suspecting that she had returned to Piso in the interval. According to one account, he told Piso, who was reclining opposite him at the wedding feast, hands off my wife, and took her home with him at once, and announced the next day that he had taken a wife in the style of Romulus and Augustus. End quote. Uh, so it's really sadistic stuff. Quote, it seems hardly worthwhile to record how Gaius treated such relatives and friends as his cousin, King Ptolemy. Their very loyalty and nearness to him earned them cruel deaths. Nor was he any more respectful or considerate in his dealings with the Senate, but made some of the highest officials run for miles beside his chariot, dressed in their togas, or wait in short linen tunics at the head or foot of his dining couch. Often he would send for men whom he had secretly killed, as though they were still alive, and remark off-handedly a few days later that they must have committed suicide. When the consuls forgot to announce his birthday, he dismissed them and left the Commonwealth for three days without its chief officers. End quote. So he's quite blasé about politics as well. 
Quote, the following instances will illustrate his cruelty. Having collected wild animals for one of his shows, he found butcher's meat too expensive and decided to feed them with criminals instead. He paid no attention to the charge sheets, but simply stood in the middle of a colonnade, glanced at the prisoners lined up before him, and gave the order, Kill every man between that bald head and that one over there. Someone had sworn to fight in the arena if he recovered from his illness. Geist forced him to fulfil his oath and watched his sword play closely, not letting him go until he had won the match and begged abjectly to be released. Another fellow had pledged himself on the same occasion to commit suicide. Gaius, finding that he was still alive, ordered him to be dressed in wreaths and fillets and driven through Rome by the imperial slaves, who had kept harping on his pledge and finally flung him over the ramparts. Many men of decent family were branded at his command and sent down the mines, or put to work on the roads, or thrown to the wild beasts. Others were confined in narrow cages, where they had to crouch on all fours like animals, or were sawn in half, and not necessarily for major offences, but merely for criticising his shows, failing to swear to his genius, and so forth. Gaius made parents attend their son's executions, and when one father excused himself on the ground of ill health, he provided a litter for him. Having invited another father to dinner just after the son's execution, he overflowed with good fellowship in an attempt to make him laugh and joke. He watched the manager of his gladiatorial and wild beast shows being flogged with chains for several days running and had him killed only when the smell of rotting brains became insupportable. <laughs> a writer of Artelian farces was burned alive in the amphitheatre because of a single line which had an amusing double entendre. One Eques, on the point of being thrown to the wild beasts, shouted that he was innocent. Gaius brought him back, removed his tongue, and then ordered the sentence to be carried out. Once he asked the returned exile how he had been spending his time. To flatter him, the man answered, I prayed continuously to the gods for Tiberius's death and your accession, and my prayer was granted. Gaius therefore concluded that the new batch of exiles must be praying for his own death, so he sent agents from island to island and had them all killed. Being anxious that one particular senator should be torn in pieces, he persuaded some of his colleagues to challenge him as a public enemy when he entered the Senate House, stab him with their pens, and then hand him over for lynching to the rest of the Senate. And he was not satisfied until the victim's limbs, organs, and guts had been dragged through the streets and heaped up at his feet. End quote. So it's really sort of um, a serial killer territory. I mean, if it's true, some have said, because it is kind of fantastic, this, isn't it? Like Some have said, of course, uh, including kind of famously Mary Beard, historian Mary Beard. Some have said that this is not true, that it can't be true. It's, it's liars after his death. People after his death have got a vested interest in making up even more fantastic liars. It was sort of in their interest to paint him as being even more evil. Um, Perhaps it's even as prosaic as Suetonius wanted to sell more books in his lifetime by making it more outrageous, but um, maybe it's true. It, a lot of it probably is true um, because it's supported by other accounts. But there's more. Quote, One man of Praetorian status, taking a cure at Antisyra, made frequent requests for an extension to his sick leave. Gaius had his throat cut suggesting that if tonics had been of little benefit over so long a period, he must need to be bled. When signing the execution list after the ten days waiting period, he used to say, I am clearing my accounts. The method of execution he preferred was to inflict numerous small wounds, avoiding the prisoner's vital organs, and his familiar order, make him feel that he is dying, soon became proverbial. Once, when the wrong man had been killed, owing to a confusion of names, he announced that the victim had equally deserved death, and he often quoted the tragic line, Let them hate me, so long as they fear me. Everything that Gaius said and did was marked with equal cruelty, even during his hours of rest and amusement and banquetry. He frequently had trials of torture held in his presence while he was eating or otherwise enjoying himself, and kept an expert headsman in readiness to decapitate the prisoners brought in from jail. When the bridge across the sea to Protoli was being dedicated, he invited a number of spectators from the shore to inspect it, and then abruptly tipped them into the water. Some clung to the ship's rudders, but he had them dislodged with boat hooks and oars and left them to drown. At a public dinner in Rome, he sent to his executioners a slave who had stolen a strip of silver from a couch. They were to lop off the man's hands, 
tie them around his neck so that they hung on his breast, and take him for a tour of the tables, displaying a placard in explanation of his punishment. On another occasion, a gladiator against whom he was fencing with a wooden sword fell down deliberately, whereupon Gaius drew a real dagger, stabbed him to death, and ran about waving a palm branch of victory. At one particular extravagant banquet, he burst into sudden peals of laughter. The consuls, who were reclining next to him, politely asked whether they might share the joke. "'What do you think?' he answered. "'It occurred to me that I have only to give one nod and both of your throats will be cut on the spot.' He played a prank on Apelles, the tragic actor, by striking a pose beside a statue of Jupiter and asking, "'Which of us two is the greater?' When Apelles hesitated momentarily, Gaius had him flogged, commenting on the musical quality even of his moans for mercy. He never kissed the neck of his wife or mistress without saying, and this beautiful throat will be cut whenever I please. Sometimes he even threatened to torture Caesonia, his wife, as a means of discovering why he was so devoted to her. He invited King Ptolemy to visit Rome, welcomed him with appropriate honours, but then suddenly ordered his execution because at Ptolemy's entrance into the amphitheatre during a gladiatorial show, the fine purple cloak which he wore had attracted universal admiration. Without warning, Gaius ordered Asius, a nobleman, to be dragged from his seat in the amphitheatre into the arena, and matched first with a Thracian net fighter, then a man-at-arms. Though Asius won both combats, he was thereupon dressed in rags, led fettered through the streets to be jeered at by women, and finally strangled. In short, however low anyone's fortune or condition might be, Gaius always found some cause for envy. He had not the slightest regard for chastity, either his own or others. Besides incest with his sisters and a notorious passion for the prostitute Pyralis, Gaius made advances to almost every well-known married woman in Rome. After inviting a selection of them to dinner with their husbands, he would slowly and carefully examine each in turn while they passed his couch as a purchaser might assess the value of a slave, and even stretch out a hand to lift up the chin of any woman who kept her eyes modestly cast down. Then, whenever he felt so inclined, he sent for whoever pleased him best, and leave the banquet in her company. A little later he would return, showing obvious signs that he had been about, and openly discuss his bedfellow in detail, dwelling on her good and bad physical points and criticising her sexual performance. End quote. So he's a pretty nasty character. He's pretty... He's pretty naughty, uh, but you can't get away with that sort of thing for long. Um, and, of course, Caligula did get his comeuppance. And uh, I suppose I'll, I'll, I'll give you that passage as well. If we're going to talk about the most <laughs> scandalous, salacious things, the most sort of interesting things, you want to know how people die often, right? So, uh, well, here's the passage. Quote, Such fantastic and reckless behaviour roused murderous thoughts in certain minds. One or two plots for his assassination were discovered, but others were still maturing, thanks to the cooperation of his most powerful freedmen and the Praetorian prefects. Two different versions of what followed are current. Some say that Chaeria came up behind Gaius as he stood talking to the boys, and with a cry of, Take this, gave him a deep sword wound in the neck, whereupon Gaius Sabinus, the other conspirator, stabbed him in the breast. The other version makes Sabinus tell certain centurions implicated in the plot to clear away the crowd and then ask Gaius for the day's watchword. He is said to have replied, Jupiter, whereupon Chiaria, from his rear, yelled, So be it, and split his jawbone as he turned his head. Gaius lay twitching on the ground. I am still alive, he shouted, but word went round, Strike again, and he succumbed to further wounds, including sword thrusts through the genitals. Gaius' bearers rushed to help him at the first alarm, using their little poles as spears, and soon his German bodyguard appeared, too late to be of any service, though they killed several of the assassins and a few innocent senators into the bargain. End quote. And there's one little two-line passage right at the end just to put a final little horrible cherry on top of the cake, one final sordid horrible little detail that Suetonius gives us. Uh, he says, quote, His wife Caesonia died at the same time as he, stabbed with a sword by a centurion, and his little daughter's brains were dashed out against a wall. End quote. 